Words uttered from one's last breaths create meaning that outlives the person speaking them. Many don't consider their final moments until they look death in the face, but Jesus did. Every word he spoke brings us new life, but none greater than in his final breaths. As he hung there on the cross, tortured, dying, struggling for air and barely able to breathe, Jesus didn't hang in silence. He spoke to those around him, strangers, family, friends. Today from the cross, Jesus is speaking to you and me. Well, good morning, church family. This morning we have the awesome honor and privilege not only of, of having baptism as part of our service, uh, but we also get to take the Lord's Supper together, okay? And uh, what an awesome day it is, right, to, to see the picture of salvation through baptism and then to participate in the elements of remembrance, both of them proclaiming and speaking the gospel to us. So if on your way in you did not get these elements, you could please lift your hand right now. There are deacons who will pop up and make sure that you get those. If you are, if you are a born-again believer, you are invited to participate in the elements with us. The entire service is moving towards our taking of the Lord's Supper together in remembrance of what Christ has done for you. Lift your hand up. If you didn't get these, you can get them right now. Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 23 as we begin a new sermon series that moves from here until Easter on uh, what's commonly known as the, the seven last words of Christ from the cross. The cross has spoken. Luke chapter 23. There's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. If you do not have a Bible, please take that as a gift from us to you. You can keep that. That is yours so that you can have a copy of God's Word. Now, there's something significant about uh, someone's last words as they come face to face with death. There, there are many uh, <clears throat> philosophers who have boasted arrogantly throughout their life, but when they come face to face with death, their tune completely changes. Let me share with you a few of them. Thomas Hobbes, who was a political philosopher, said, I say again, if I had the whole world at my disposal, I would give it all to live just one more day. I am about to take a leap into the dark. Or Thomas Paine, a leading atheist in the American colonies, said, stay with me for God's sake. I cannot bear to be left alone. Oh, Lord, help me. Oh, God, what have I done to suffer so much? What will become of me hereafter? Send even a child to stay with me, for I am on the edge of hell here alone. And Voltaire a lifelong deist, a critic of Christianity. Although he was incredibly wealthy and famous, Voltaire was filled with great fear upon his deathbed. Calling the doctor, he pleaded with him, I am abandoned by God and man. I will give you half of everything I owe if you will give me six more months to live. The doctor replied, sir, you cannot live six weeks. To that, Voltaire replied, then I shall go to hell, and you shall go with me. Now contrast that with uh, David Brenard, a missionary to the Native Americans who, who died at the young age of 29 with tuberculosis in excruciating pain. And upon his deathbed, David uttered, I am almost in eternity. I long to be there. My work is done. All the world is now nothing to me. Oh, to be in heaven. Or Adoniram Judson, the American missionary, said, I go with gladness of a boy bounding away from school. I feel so strong in Christ. Or D.L. Moody, the evangelist, died at the age of 62 and upon his deathbed, he uttered the words, 
The earth recedes. Heaven opens before me. If this is death, it is sweet. There is no valley here. God is calling me. I must go. No, no, Father, Moody's son said. You are dreaming. I am not dreaming, Moody replied. This is my triumph. This is my coronation day, and it is glorious. See, there's something significant about one's final words when you come face to face with death. This morning, we begin with this new sermon series, The Cross Has Spoken. And as we move towards Easter, we're going to look at the seven pronouncements of Christ from the cross. Now, these are often called the seven last words of Christ, which is unfortunate because it implies that he didn't rise again, right? Christ had much to say after his resurrection. But still, there is great significance at the way that that Jesus spoke from the cross. Because even though he was being crucified, He was in full control. He knew that he was laying down his life. He knew that his death was accomplishing atonement for sin. And he loved others. He was present enough in that moment to think of others, even though he was in acute suffering. So listen as I read our first saying from the cross out of Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 33. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by, looking on. And even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, this morning, uh, as, as we have opened your word and as we are going to take a, a focused look at your son's death on the cross, Father, it is good for us to drink deeply from the cross. Father, we pray right now in Jesus' name that you would open our eyes deeper still to the truth of your son, to your magnificent grace this incredible truth that you would be glorified by your mercy and by your grace. And for us to not see that is to not see the beauty. It is to be blind to the absolute magnificence of you and your character and your love for us. Father, we pray that you would set free this morning. We pray that you would save amongst us. We pray that those who are saved would would have a renewed passion, a passion that overflows into walking out in newness of life that only comes from drinking deeply from your love. Your love overflows into everything in our lives to walk worthy of you. And we pray all of that in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know about you, but I remember watching the passion of the Christ in the movie theater for the first time. Leaving the theater in complete silence, going and sitting in my car for what seemed like an hour. I didn't have words. I was in shock at the brutality of Christ's suffering. You know, you and I can become so familiar with saying that Jesus suffered and was crucified for our sins that we forget that pain demands to be heard, that Jesus hurt, that he bled just like you and me. 
This morning, I need to build up to our scene of this first saying from the cross so that you and I can see the magnificence. Because the context here is everything for us to understand. And it may be difficult for you. You may sit in shock just like I did. But remember, Jesus had to suffer brutally because he was behind enemy lines, reconciling us, rescuing us from the power of sin and death. He waded out into the water of our sin and the fury of hell was released upon him. So let us begin at the garden where the weight of all that was coming drops him to the ground and where he will pray alone three times for an hour while the disciples sleep. We will come back to this moment later in the series, but for now, think of his isolation. No one can walk this road with him. He is alone. Suddenly, his betrayer is at hand. Judas and a mob of guards and the Jewish leaders. The disciples scatter in fear as the armed guards take Jesus back to Caiaphas' house. The trial that is there that night in the darkness is a sham. They make accusations against him, trying to find anything that can stick. And then suddenly he's punched in the face. His mouth fills with blood. All the while, Peter is denying that he even knows Jesus just yards away. The leaders walk by one by one, and spit in his face as they turn him over to the Roman guards. That night, the guards will make sport of him. They will blindfold him and crack him upside the head, laughing, mocking, prophesy, who hit you? His ears ring and his head spins. He has become momentarily disoriented. Again, pain demands to be heard, doesn't it? Every other need or desire is forced into the background as pain consumes your attention. Fast forward in your mind to the next morning and Jesus is before Pilate at Antonia's fortress. The masses scream, crucify him, crucify him as it rains down upon Jesus. Pilate tries a goodwill offering of releasing a prisoner at Passover. But the crowd chooses Barabbas, a known murderer, instead. Well, what should I do with Jesus? And again, the crowd thunderously yells, crucify him. Next comes the scourging, the dreaded flagellum whip that had throngs that ended in pieces of bone and lead. Eusebius would write later, he tells of martyrs who were torn open by scourgings, exposing the hidden contents of their entrails and organs to sight. You see, when they are done, Jesus is lying in a pool of his blood, and his muscle and cartilage are torn from his back. The crossbeam is thrust upon him, upon his shoulders, but he can only carry it a short distance before he collapses on the road. The crowd jeers and laughs at what a pathetic mess he has become. They are merciless in heaping shame upon him. Atop the hill called Golgotha, They strip him naked, they stretch out his arms across the beam, 
and began to drive nine inch nails through his wrist. Hear the sound of the clink, clink, clink. Signals of acute pain shoot through his body. It is excruciating. Maximum pain and suffering. As the crucifix is lifted, erect, Jesus' shoulders dislocate. He must push himself off of his nail-pierced feet for every single breath. There he hangs in utter shame, bleeding, marred beyond recognition, exhausted in excruciating pain. And Jesus lifts himself up with great effort so that he might speak, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Light out of darkness, beauty out of grotesque, forgiveness out of hate, Right? What might we expect from such a moment? Voltaire was filled with anger at death alone. He wanted companionship. He demanded more time. And when it, when it wasn't given to him, he was angry. Pause for a moment and think about the events of just this week. With the, uh, with the events at the high school of the active shooter and bombing. And that scare, what we circled up as, as a staff and, and just began to pray. And when, you, when you're faced with crisis like that, there, there are waves of emotion where, where there's fear and then there's anger, right? And, and you, you realize as, as one of our people in the office has, has a son there at the high school, and we're praying for him. You realize in those moments, you will do anything to protect your loved ones, right? Anything to protect them. And understandably so, right? The, the, the police officers have, have, there are moms showing up, moms upon moms. It's full. They got to keep them across the street. Why? Because you are willing to do anything at that moment. And here hangs Jesus, innocent, mocked, indescribable pain. What is right? What is just? Yet he does not rise to his feet and shout, you will see. Every one of you will burn in hell. Mock me now, but you will see. Father, curse them for their sin. No. No revenge. No self-defense. As they revile, he does not revile in return. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. J.C. Rao wrote, it is worthy of a remark that as soon as the blood of the great sacrifice began to flow, the great high priest began to intercede. I mean, do you see the glory in that? Right, in stark contrast to those who are surrounding him and hurling shame. The sovereign, eternal, omnipotent son did not threaten, did not condemn. Instead, he prayed for them. He interceded on their behalf. Verse 34, and they cast lots, dividing up his garments among them. And the people stood by, looking on. And even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, he saved others. Let him save himself if 
This is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine, saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Surrounding the cross, there are three groups who reject Jesus. A large part of the crowd are onlookers, curious as to what might come of this, right? The same masses that celebrated his triumphal entry just days before has now been convinced that they can force God's hand and crucify this so-called Messiah. Right? That if he is who he claims to be, he will save himself. For they think he cannot become the curse of God. And so they stand and they demand, Jesus, come down from the cross. And for this, they are guilty. For they have murdered an innocent man. And they are testing God. They are standing over in judgment of Jesus. And they reject him. Now, the second group around the cross are the Jewish leaders who mock Jesus. They hate him. They are jealous of him. They see him as a threat to their power. Deep inside, their self-righteousness boils over when they come face to face with the Son of God. And insecurity is covered over with hatred. They taunt and they sneer in rejection. Ha! Huh. God's chosen one. Well, we'll see. He's just getting what he deserves. The third group that reject Jesus are the Roman soldiers who have violently beat and mocked an innocent man. They were joyful as they inflicted pain upon him. They pressed down a crown of thorns, draped him in a purple robe, made sport of him as they blindfolded and beat him. And now they shame him further by casting lots for his clothes. Hey, king, save yourself, they taunt. But he doesn't save himself because then he can't save anyone else. And surrounded by their rejection, This is his response. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Now, what a moment. What a moment to be able to cut open Jesus and to see what spills out in maximum pain, in complete rejection. When squeezed to the point of death, what spills out? His love, his forgiveness, even his approachableness. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet liars, while we were yet gossips, while we were yet deceitful and and. and apathetic and envious, while we were prayerless, while we were greedy, while we were his enemies, while we were actually fighting against him. At that moment, when we were completely against him, completely away from him, at that moment is when Christ died for you. Friend, if he responded like this to those who are killing him, then how much more does he respond to you when you approach in your sin? This past week on Wednesday night, we, we, we had a special, special talk on pornography and pressing into uh, giving tools and helps for parents. And we took some anonymous questions. And there was one that came in that that I have been chewing over and over and over, and I want to repeat it to you. Again, it's anonymous, but I think it it gives us a clue into the human heart. The question was, if I am a Christian and I'm still caught in the sin of pornography, 
Does Christ still love me? The question is there, because I ought to know better, right? Because my eyes have been open and I still sin. At that moment, does Christ still love me when I continue to sin and I'm caught in my sin? Beloved, you know what the answer is? A resounding yes, a resounding yes. Does he still love me? Of course he does. Do you not understand that he is holding on to you? You are not holding on to him. I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. It's not like he saved you and then he expects you to hold on to him. That's not the way, do do you not understand that it is only by his love It is only through that power that you walk out in victory. Here's the truth. He died for even that sin. Even your sin of complacency. Even your sin of returning back to the vomit that you should walk out of. He died for even that sin. It is only through his power that uh, uh, an understanding that love that you will ever walk out. Hear me. While you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Let me ask this question. For whom was Christ praying? The answer is he was praying for all three groups that I mentioned. Everyone under the sound of his voice, the crowd, the Jewish leaders, and the Roman guards. They do not understand because they are blinded by sin and hatred. They do not understand God, nor do they understand the wisdom of God. Jews seek for a sign and Greeks search for wisdom. But Christ crucified is the power of God and the wisdom of God. That is that Jesus rises above the entire circumstance, rises above their foolishness and their darkened hearts, and he prayed for them. Now, what specifically was Jesus asking when he asked for their forgiveness? Well, for starters, he was not absolving them from being responsible agents of his death. How do you know that? Well, when Peter preaches after Pentecost to the crowds, in fact, repeatedly, the press is, you put Jesus, God's Messiah, to death, right? They were responsible. Well, then what does Jesus mean whenever he asks for their forgiveness? Catch this, because it's incredible. Jesus is pleading with God the Father to not write them off and give them the wrath that they deserve. Father, do not turn them over to destruction because of this. Instead, still send the Holy Spirit. In fact, use this sin, convict, show them that, that the nature of their sin, that through this they need a Savior. Even more, may this sin be used to bring them to me. Now that is marvelous. And that is exactly what happens. Imagine with me the centurion of Matthew uh, that Matthew references in 28, uh, 54. He is mocking and he is laughing, right? Possibly he's the one who, who won the cloak after casting lots. Can you, can you picture the scene? He's caught the cloak. He's parading around. I've got the cloak. I've got the cloak. And he, he staggers in pain, mocking Jesus. And in an instant, he's Cut to the quick, he stops in his tracks because he hears Jesus cry from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He's stunned in silence. I don't know what to do with a love like that. And his heart, in an instant, the Spirit of God breaks his heart of stone and gives him 
a heart that loves Jesus, saves him. Matthew 27, 54 says, when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. That is a direct answer to Jesus' prayer. And the one that should overwhelm our senses about the grace of God. To quote J.C. Ryle again, We have probably not the least idea of how many conversions to God at Jerusalem took place during the first six months after the crucifixion that were a direct reply to this marvelous prayer. Perhaps this prayer was the first step towards the thief's repentance. Perhaps the centurion too. And the people who left beating their breasts Perhaps the 300 converted on the day of Pentecost may mostly be among those who were the Lord's murderers and owed their conversion to this very prayer. You see, there is no God like our God. Indescribable compassion, unexplainable mercy, amazing grace. No sin is greater than his love. There is no circumstance where you would approach him in order to seek forgiveness, where you would say, I repent and I believe. There is no circumstance where he would reject you. No circumstance where he would turn you away. That if he would pray for the very ones who are killing him to still come to him, what about you? So friend, if you're here this morning and, and you have been resistant to him, if you have hardened your heart, like has there ever been a moment when you have stared straight at your sin and said, you know what? It is my sin that nailed him there. That it was for my sin he died. Do you find yourself in need of a savior this morning? Right before we take the Lord's Supper, what a privilege it is for me to say to you, Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day. The Lord is near for all who would call upon him with faith like a child would look to him and his finished work on the cross would declare, I am a sinner. I have no hope in myself, but I look completely to the finished work on the cross. He will save. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Would you cry out in faith right now for his forgiveness? And you too can be born again. The offer is open. Most of us here know a time when we placed our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So as you prepare the bread, Beloved, we're going to take this together. You see, in one sense, it was my sin that put him there. And in one sense, it was your sin that put him there. His body broken. And what did he cry? Father, forgive them. 
So before we take this bread, the scripture teaches us, do not take it in an unworthy manner. Pause. Allow the spirit to search your heart. Come with open hands and say, convict me. Show me my sin. Forgive me of my sin so that I might have newness of life all through him. So I'll give you just a few moments for you to do business with the Lord and then we will take this together. It was the night of the Passover that Jesus, with his disciples, took some bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, beloved, as you prepare the cup, I want you to remember that God answered Jesus' prayer. That's what we've unfolded throughout this sermon. Father, forgive them. And this cup is a cup of celebration. That yes, we, we, we are broken, we come contrite, we kneel before the cross, we come through the gospel. But Jesus never leaves us in our sin. We walk out in victory. And this cup is a reminder of that victory. A new covenant in his blood that you are his own. That he has covered you completely with his righteousness. Right? So we leave here celebrating the hope and the love to be able to live new lives in Christ. I'll give you just a moment because I want you to celebrate. He he doesn't leave us in our sin. And in the same way, he took the cup. He said, this is a new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me for the forgiveness of sins. Will you pray with me? King Jesus, we rejoice. There is no God like you. You have indescribable mercy. There there is no end to your grace. You are magnificent. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and you, above it all, want to be glorified by your mercy and by your grace. And we rejoice in that today. Your mercy brings life, life to to our dead, hardened hearts. You've given us new hearts and a new covenant and the ability to walk out in freshness of life. And even when we sin, even still, 
Your love never stops. You never stop calling us your own, that we are your beloved, that we are your chosen. And it is that love, as we drink deeper still, that causes us to walk in newness of life. Your word says that we will spend all of eternity trying to grasp deeper the grace and mercy that was unfolded on the cross. We love you and we rejoice in you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, church family, as the praise team comes to lead us in one final song, this is your chance to respond to what the Lord has been doing, right? You you have had time to take the Lord's Supper. You have searched your heart. You've confessed. You've laid it before the cross. Now you get to stand and sing in faith. Sing in faith. Shout it from the rooftops that your God is near, that he has saved. Let us celebrate. We'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you. If you came in with a burden, do not leave carrying that burden on your own. Okay, we are a family. Allow us to carry that together. So whatever the Lord has pressed upon your heart, you be obedient in faith to respond to him. Would you stand?